All right, what is up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the European Volleyball Show. My name is Rob St. Clair, and it is a big, big week in European Volleyball. It is Champions League quarterfinals, the first of the two legs of the round of eight on both the men's and the women's sides, and there were some unbelievable matches already this week. So we're going to jump into my reactions and analysis of the three matches that have already happened and preview the one more match later today on the men's side, Trentino versus Berlin, um, coming up at 8.30 p.m. CET, so about 45 minutes from right this second. Uh, you're turning into just the right place to talk about all this great volleyball that's going on this week, next week, the rest of Champions League. So uh, let us know in the chat. I'm reading the chat if you've got any questions. Let us know who you think is going to win later today, who you're rooting for uh, just to win the titles in Champions League on both the men's and the women's sides. So let's jump into some volleyball that happened this week, starting off with, let's start with the first match that happened. There we go. Zhezhov versus Vakif Bank Istanbul on the women's side. This was crazy, crazy upset. Totally set the tone for the week. Uh, Zhezhov at home beating one of the, the very favorites to win the entire tournament, beating Vakif Bank Istanbul in five. And the first thing that jumps out to me is look at the set scores. I mean, 13-25 the first set, like an absolute beatdown by Vakif Bank. Then Zhezhov responds and steals one in the second, 29-27. Third set, pretty convincing for Vakov Bank again, 25-19. Fourth set, Zhezhov steals another one, 29-27, and then they, they get away with it late in the fifth at 15-13. That's a, a program-defining win for Zhezhov uh, and Coach Stefan Antiga. This, is, this Zhezhov club has only existed for like 10 years. This is their first time ever at this point in Champions League and they take down one of the one of the great clubs in volleyball history in Vakov Bank at home. So this match was incredible. However, <laughs> now in order for Zhezhov to advance, they have to go to Turkey next Wednesday to Vakov Bank, to Istanbul and beat them again at home or at least force it to five uh, to have a chance at a golden set. So just to quickly go over the way that the Champions League format works for the, f the quarterfinal round and the semifinal round the teams will play two matches, a two-match series, uh, one at each team's home gym. Uh, and then after that, it, it, it comes down to the points earned by each team from the two matches to see who advances. So here, for example, Zhezhov gets two points from a five-set win, Vakif Bank one point from a five-set loss. So the situations for next week are if Vakif Bank wins the match at home, in three or four sets, they advance. So they're they're far from out of this thing at this point. Um, if Vakif Bank wins in five, we go to a golden set. The the most exciting thing in all of volleyball. And we'll talk about golden sets and the potential for them in the rest of these matches this week. Uh, last but not least, if Zhezhov wins the match next week at all, it's over. They advance and Vakif Bank is eliminated. So the pressure uh, on the Turkish side for next week's match. But let's let's dive into the stats of this one just a little bit. So uh, looking at Zhezhov as the team, the, and actually both of these teams, the, 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 a huge number that jumps out to me, this one right here, 62 attacking attempts for Yelena Blagojevic, and then 60 attacking attempts for Isabel Hock. I can't believe the volume of offensive attempts that some of these teams are putting on their best, just their best offensive players. And this happens to me more it happens in my opinion more on the women's side than it does on the men's where you just have one just supernatural point scoring player who you just rely on to score so many points for you that's clearly hawk for Vakif Bank she's been doing it for years and this match uh, it was Blagojevic for Zhezhov but uh, Kara Bayama really good match Maybe the best player in the match was Zhezhov, in my opinion. Anna Stencil in the middle. I mean, 17 points, 13 for 22, two blocks, two aces. For a middle blocker, that is an outstanding stat line. Really, really good. Uh, this Zhezhov team played extremely well. I, uh, I And especially, like, the mental fortitude that it takes to just get destroyed in the first set, 25-13, and then come back and respond and be able to win the match at home. The crowd in Poland was amazing. Such a fun match to watch. I highly recommend going back and checking out the replays. But really, just rather than just looking at the numbers here, overall for me, this felt like Zhezhov stealing this match. They definitely got away with uh, a couple 
very poor sets of volleyball where Vakipek was clearly the better team. But they were, Zhezhov was extremely clutch. They got great defensive touches, great block touches at just the right times late in sets and were able to turn them into points when Vakipeng kind of wasn't. They normally, a, a team of Vakipeng's caliber who's been there before at every level will will be the team in those late game situations to take care of the tiny little details and to make that one little play to, to slow down that attack or to keep a ball up off the floor and create those those two-point swing situations but this time it was Zhezhov playing at home I was really impressed by that however <laughs> like we already talked about in order for Zhezhov to advance they now have to go to Vakif Bank and and either win again or at least force it to five and win a golden set and this reminds me really it really reminds me a lot of the series from last season's Champions League where Vakif Bank played Busto Arsizio. Uh, it was it was extremely similar. Uh, Busto won that first match in the series in five, and, and they kind of came out of nowhere in doing so. But then Vakif Bank responded the following week and just beat them down three sets to none to advance. I would not be at all surprised if we see that same thing happening here. I know we've got a, a huge Vakif Bank fan base here on the CV YouTube channel, so uh, their team is far from out of this thing. They they can advance even without a golden set if they win next week's match in three or four sets. I expect them, with a the home crowd behind them, to really take care of business. I, I would think that that match will be pretty convincing, but uh, there is a little bit of pressure on Vakif Bank, and we saw... It was very interesting, the the body language from the team and listening to Coach Giovanni Gadetti in the timeouts late in the fourth and late in the fifth set. They were they were on edge. They Their body language as a team was not good. So they're going to have to respond uh, next week playing at home. I expect them to do so. I think Vakif Bank is just such a, an absolute powerhouse. They're incredible at every position with almost no weaknesses. But all the credit in the world to Zhezhov for pulling off this win at home. Re again, a program-defining win for them and a huge tone setter for Champions League this week. This was a crazy upset. I couldn't believe this match. It was really, really fun to watch. So uh, scanning the chat here for a couple questions. Uh, if there's any questions about this women's match or about anything, uh, put them in the chat right now. If not, I think we can move on to the men's match that happened earlier this week, which was equally crazy. Yeah, let's flip over to that. Lube Chivitanova versus Jabshevsky Vagil on the men's side. This was in Italy, in Chivitanova, and Jabshevsky Vagil comes in, no Yuri Glotter, no Stefan Boyer, really no excuses for Lube, and they sweep one of the favorites to win the competition on the men's side. Three sets to none, 25-22, 25-23, 25-19. This was crazy. Now the best that Lube can do is go to Poland next week and force a golden set. So that's that's the situation. If JW, as I'll, I'll shorten Jaszewski Vigo to JW a decent amount, just so you guys know, if JW forces this next week's match to five, it's over. They advance even if they lose the match. If JW wins next week's match at all, they advance and Lube's out. So Lube has to, has to win next week's match in three or four sets in order to force a golden set. That would be played like immediately after the end of the match, a quick sprint to 15 to decide who advances. And we saw a very similar thing to this last year. Uh, the, the, just had a question there. What is what is a golden set? A golden set is perhaps the most exciting thing in all of volleyball with the way this, this tournament is formatted. If, if the teams are tied in points after the two matches that they play, they immediately play a one-set tiebreaker to 15 to decide who advances, and that's what we very well may have in this match right here. Uh, we saw something similar last year in the quarterfinals of last year's Champions League. Lube Chivitanova took on Zaxa, Kedjidin Kojle, who ended up going on to win the whole tournament, and we had a golden set situation there because in that first match, um, Zaxa came out and to a su as a surprise to many, they beat that Lube team. I think it was in Italy as well. And then Lube, sure enough, they went to Poland, they forced a golden set, and I think they lost it like 16-14. So that very well could be what we're seeing here. But let's dive into the stats of this one a little bit more. An extremely uncharacteristically bad performance for Lube across the board, with the exception of Robert Landy Simone. I mean, 9 for 11 attacking, 3 blocks, 2 aces, 14 points. That is insane. That that's that's For a middle blocker, that is absolutely otherworldly numbers. It's It's absurd. And we know that just about any any match that Lube plays, uh, Luciano De Checo wants to feed Lube or wants to feed Simone, excuse me, as much as humanly possible. He's the best middle on the planet. 
in my opinion. I, I don't think it's particularly close. And he puts up numbers like this. He's an absolute matchup nightmare for just anybody who tries to play against him. And I thought that that would be such an enormous advantage for Lube against this Yashevsky team uh, because, like, so Yuri Glotter, one of their starting middle blockers, out with injury. They're just not, they don't have a middle blocker who can come even close to slowing down Simone. And sure enough, Simone 9 for 11, 3 blocks, 2 aces. That's a crazy performance. But that's kind of where the good news ended for Lube. It, they had just nothing going on. Uh, one of the great questions is, why is Osmani Wantarena not playing? That's a good question. And I, t to be honest, I don't totally know the answer. What we do know is that he's coming off a back injury. Uh, after the Olympic Games last summer in like August or September or so, um, Osmani hasn't played very much volleyball at all since that tournament. Uh, we expected him to come back months ago. There was a little bit of a setback with his back injury. Uh, we thought he was going to come back here. He had announced he was going to come back uh, last weekend in Lube's domestic match against Modena, but he didn't suit up for that one. Uh, he did dress for this match that happened on Tuesday, but didn't see the court at all. And with... Uh, I mean, Lucarelli, one of the, their other outside hitter, was fine. Uh, 11 points, 9 for 17, like one ace, one block, like okay efficiency. Not bad. Uh, Marlon Yant was not very good at all. 7 for 21, 5 errors attacking, only 9 points. And uh, Yant had, I think, sprained his ankle slightly against Modena this past weekend. This Lube team needs needs Osmani Wantarena. They need him to come back and be a factor for this team. I don't think they have any chance of accomplishing their goals in both Champions League and in Italy, in, which is with this crazy deep and talented as the Italian league is. It's They, they have to get Osmani Wantarena back, not just his on-court play, but his effect, his leadership, his, his chemistry, his, his personality on court, I think is extremely important for this Lube team. And they've been missing it because... His uh, ball control, his first contact, his serve reception as well is is really important to them. And he's just not a guy that makes very many errors. That Lube's got a big problem with making too many errors lately. They made um, just way too many errors against Modena this past weekend. Uh, 17 attacking errors combined in two sets, uh, or in three sets against Jaszczewski the other day. So nine balls hit out of bounds and blocked eight times. In three sets, that's way too many. Five attacking errors from Gabi Garcia Fernandez. That's not good at all. Uh, three attacking errors, like just, like just balls hit out of bounds from Marlon. Yeah, like this is a very uncharacteristic Lube performance. I would, I really would like to see Osmani Wantarena come back and help them out, but I really want to give a lot of the credit here to Yashevsky Vagil. I don't think people are talking about enough about how well this team played, and completely different than the team, the Yashevsky team that played like a week and a half ago and got stomped in the finals of the Polish Cup by Zaksa. Uh, three, that was a, a three nothing, like pretty convincing win for Kedzic and Kozla in that one. So this JW team managed to completely turn it around. Jan Hadrava, really good day, uh, thirteen for twenty two, like four fifty or so efficiency, which is outstanding. Uh, a block as well, and he he had one of those days. Like Hadrava's not not the kind of opposite who's gonna like just overpower a block, hit over, hit high. Uh, get a, a bunch of super like clean kills straight to the floor. He is a guy that's just going to hammer the ball into the high part of the block and try and get some good deflections to score his points. And he did that extremely well. And that's a that's a tough thing for, for a blocking team to play against a hitter like that because if you're blocking a guy and you feel like you're there but he's getting all these deflections off your arms and scoring out of bounds, it becomes even more difficult and frustrating to stop a guy like that. So Hadrava's play style perhaps the perfect the perfect fit for JW against the, in the Lube matchup in particular. Uh, I thought Jakub Popivchak, their libero, was outstanding. Uh, Benjamin Toniuti, I mean, it goes without saying. The guy's just a legend and maybe a little bit of uh, Lube kryptonite after uh, Toniuti playing for Zaxa last year did kind of the same thing against the same Lube team at this same point in last year's tournament. Uh, Trevor Cleveno, like, okay, 6 for 17. They didn't need him that much on offense. Uh, Tomas Fornal, really good. Uh, 12 for 20, 50% efficiency. That's excellent. Uh, Jakob Masira, like uh, their backup middle blocker, wearing number 95, which is a cool number. Like he was pretty good, a great role player. Three blocks led the match. Like man, Yashevsky coming out of nowhere and making this 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 leg this particular matchup really interesting. I know when I was previewing all of Champions League, this was the particular matchup that I 
thought was going to be the most convincing, at least after uh, after some of the schedule adjustments with some some series getting canceled or forfeit. But I expected Lube to have no problem getting past this Jaszewski team. I think they're they're better one to one at just about every position except like maybe setter. I think Tony Ut and Decheco, you could totally make an argument there, but. I mean, Robert Lenny, Simone, Simone Anzani. I don't think JW has middles that can hang around with that. Uh, Ivan Zaitsev, who I was surprised didn't get the start. Uh, very surprised didn't get the start at opposite. But when he's on top form, I think he's a better opposite than Jan Hadrava is. Uh, outsides, I mean, Luca Relli, absolutely elite. I, I I don't know, man. I was really, really surprised, happily surprised by this Yashevsky performance. Very, very impressed. Now the best that Lube can do is go to Poland next week. I think that's I think it's next Wednesday. Go to Yashevsky and beat him in three or four to force a golden set. That is the only way that Lube can advance at this point. Uh, Yashevsky Vega with a huge upset, perhaps a tournament defining upset. Uh, the winner of that series, by the way. The winner of the Lube Chivdinova and, and Yashevsky series plays Zaksa Kedrzin Kozle in the semifinals. So uh, interesting matchups there, regardless of who wins this one, because uh, it could be an all Polish semifinal or it could be a rematch from last year. So super excited about that. But yeah, this match this match was incredible. Go back and watch it. I think it was on Eurovolley.tv. Make sure you pick up a subscription to Eurovolley.tv, by the way, uh, so you can watch all these Champions League matches. But this was a stunner. Really, really fun to watch and sets up great for a potential golden set next week. I think that, so the Vakif Bank was off series on the women's side. I, I would predict that Vakif Bank will respond and win that one in three or four sets to advance without a golden set. This one, uh, Lube versus Jaszewski, this one probably will go to a golden set if I had to pick it right now. Like I think Lube will be able to flip the switch. I think they have the pure raw talent um, to rely upon to beat a team like Jaszewski, even in a hostile environment in Poland. Maybe we should get to see some Juan Terena. Maybe not, but uh, definite golden set potential next week, and that's some of the most exciting volleyball you'll ever see in club, national team, anywhere. Golden sets are just the best, so I'm kind of rooting for that, to be honest. Uh, all right, I'm scanning through the chat here really quickly before we move on to the all-Italian women's match that happened yesterday. Uh, how can Modena claim a spot for next year's Champions League? Uh, good question. The The way that you qualify for Champions League is to finish at, at the top of your domestic league. So uh, Italy, for example, Italy gets three teams. Uh, the top three teams that finish in Italy uh, get a berth in next year's Champions League. So Modena would need to at least make the semifinals of the Italian playoffs. And I'm not sure exactly what the tiebreaker is between the two, the two teams that lose in the semis in terms of who gets a Champions League berth or not. But that's how it works. It has nothing to do with the previous year's CEV competition. It's all about how you finish in your domestic league to qualify for the following year's Champions League. Uh, scanning through for a couple more questions. Yashevsky getting heavily underestimated. They were amazing last year, but didn't get to play any games in Champions League because of COVID. Great point. Glad you brought that up. So this Yashevsky team last year was really, really good as well. They were last year's Polish champions, even though Zaksa won the Men's Champions League. Uh, they lost to Yashevsky, I think, in, in just two matches, two matches to none in the Polish playoffs. So uh, JW, the reigning league champions, I, I agree, haven't been talked about enough. They were really good last year. They got the opportunity to play a Champions League taken away from them because of COVID, and now they're now they're, now they're they're here and they're taking serious advantage of the opportunity that they have, which is awesome to see. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, I think that's about all the questions on that for now. Let's move on to yesterday's match. Back to the women's side, the all-Italian battle. Vero Voli Monza versus the reigning champions of Imoco Canaliano. And where where do you even begin with this one? This uh, this matchup was crazy. So Canaliano winning yesterday three sets to none. But just to set the stage for it a little bit, the winner of this goes straight to the Super Finals, uh, bypasses the semis completely because of forfeits on the other side and on the same side of the bracket. So... The winner of this matchup, this two-match series, straight to the finals, which is just all that much more drama on this already great Italian battle. So Corneliano, the reigning champions, have been pretty suspect the, the last couple weeks at least, including losing to Monza in Italian competition in four just a couple weeks ago. And all Monza's done since then is pick up the reigning Olympic most valuable player. They pick up Jordan Larson. Uh, they, get, uh, they got... Uh, Dana Retke, the young American like superstar middle blocker coming over around the new year. They've really made a lot of moves to prove that they're a legitimate 
championship contender in both Champions League and in Italy. But sure enough, as shaky as Cornelian has been the last couple weeks, uh, losing to Novara last week, losing to Monza a couple weeks ago, they came out and they put on a clinic against Monza on the road. Uh, let's scroll down to the stats really quick. This was a Paola Egonu stat line. Listen to this. Three sets. Remember, this is a three-set match of 25-21, 25-21, 25-19. Three sets. Paola Egonu, 27 points. Unbelievable. 27 points in three sets. Nine points per set for Paola Egonu. 22 for 40 attacking. Only three errors never blocked. Like, that's just shy of 50% efficiency. It's crazy. Three aces, two blocks. One of the great individual performances I've really ever seen. And it's no surprise that we get this from Paolo Egonu. I think I would call her the best player on the planet. Um, I know Coach Giovanni Gudetti of Vaca Bank has had a line about that there's only one team in the world that I'm afraid of, and it's whichever team has Paolo Egonu. And the, one of the criticisms about Imoko this year has been that they rely on Egonu too much. And if she doesn't have a world-class performance kind of like this, then Imoko has no chance because they haven't had the production from the middles and from the outside hitter position that maybe they had last year. Now, they still have Ioana Volos, one of the best setters in the world. Uh, Robin de Croix, Raffaella Foley, as good of a pair of middles as there are in the world. And they did shuffle their outside hitters around a little bit, but a, a huge factor for them is getting Miriam, Miriam Silla back to playing at close to top form. Now, she only scored 10 points, 8 for 25 attacking. That's like not outstanding, but at least she was able to get the start and produce and hang in there, passing the ball pretty well, 56% positive. That's a nice number. So her, along with Catherine Plummer, is a much more like offensively-minded lineup choice for Coach Santarelli of Corneliano, and that gives the opposing block just a little bit more to think about and still have to attempt to stop Paola Egonu on the right side. And what really this match came down to is that there was absolutely no way for them to stop Paola Egonu. Like, 27 points in three sets is one of the most ridiculous numbers I've ever seen. Nine points per set. That's just, that's just crazy. Truly unstoppable offensively, plus blocking and serving from Egonu. You just can't you can't beat her. You can't beat a team that she's on when she plays like that. And that's what is just so much fun about some of these truly elite world class like superstar point scorers on a couple of these Champions League teams, like Agonu, like an Isabella Hawk, like Magdalena Stisiak of Monza when she's truly on, on at the top of her game. You, there's there are some players in volleyball, and even though volleyball's in my opinion the most team dominated sport in the world. There are some players that when they're truly at their best, you just can't stop them. And Egonu was was totally like that in this match. Unbelievable performance from her. Uh, look at the Monza stats really quick. There's not really that much that jumps out to me here. Um, Magdalena Stisiak offensively, okay, not great, 12 for 29. Uh, Alessia Gennari, okay, 5 for 11. Uh, Jordan Larson, 4 for 12. No, uh, sorry, that, that's Recky's stat line. Um, Larson, four for 20, 14 for 28. That's pretty good, uh, just under 50% efficiency. That's very, very good, but uh, not as good. Passing numbers for Monza, five blocks. Uh, that's okay for three sets, but that's supposed to be an extremely good blocking team. What it really just came down to is that Monza just had absolutely no answer for Paula Egonu. It really was just that simple. And uh, as again, as shaky as Caneliano's looked a little bit the last couple weeks, I had a feeling that they'd be able to flip a switch when they really needed it, and Egonu would deliver when her, their team's back was against the wall. Sure enough, a, a three sets to none win on the road, which sets up next week. The only way for Monza to advance is to go to Corneliano, beat them in four or three or four sets and force a golden set. That is the only way Monza can advance at this point, and it is not impossible. That's the fun part about this. We just saw it a couple weeks ago. Uh, Monza beat Corneliano on the road in four. We, we saw it, and all they did since then, again, was add the reigning Olympic Most Valuable Player in Jordan Larson. So it's super possible, very possible for Monza to force a golden set next week, but not if Paola Igonu plays like that. If she plays like that, the, if, if every match they play like that, they're probably just going to win this tournament again. And that's the crazy thing is that they there are only two more matches that stand between Imoko and defending their title. If they win next week against Monza, they go straight to the finals. They bypass the semifinals completely. And then it's just a one-match championship match at that point. So if you get two more 
unbelievable like top level Pella Egonu performances, we very well could be looking at a repeat champion, Canigliano. So this sets up for a really spicy matchup next week in Italy. Uh, it's going to be really fun to watch. So that'll, that'll be going down next Wednesday, the 16th. All right, last thing we have to do today on the show before we wrap up and jump in to go watch the match is to preview the one final quarterfinal matchup happening this week. Berlin versus Trentino on the men's side. Uh, this is going to be awesome. I am so excited for this matchup. Uh, I'll be on the call for this match. Uh, it's, it starts in just about 20 minutes, by the way. First serve here on the YouTube channel in about 20 minutes. Uh, link is in the description. It should be pretty easy to find how to watch the match. It's free for everyone. So I'll be commentating this. Uh, we can all uh, hop over from the show to the match and watch it all together. It'll be a blast. Trentino, second place in Pool E, 4-2. Uh, and two. Their only defeats to Perugia. Uh, no shame in losing to Perugia. They're my pick to win the entire tournament. Uh, and Berlin, really shocking the world by traveling to Russia. This is before any um, restrictions or sanctions were imposed on Russia. Uh, Berlin going to Zenit St. Petersburg, beating them twice, both of them in five sets to win their pool. That was incredible. And I commentated one of those games. The question for me before that was, how is this Berlin team going to compare to the rest of Europe? Because they're so far and away clearly the best team in Germany, and it's not even close, that it was very difficult to evaluate how they were going to stack up against great, great teams from elsewhere in Europe, like a Zenit St. Petersburg, like a Trentino here, for example. And sure enough, Berlin came out and they played unbelievable volleyball in Russia a couple weeks ago, uh, winning both those matches in five. Incredibly clutch. Very interesting the way that Berlin is built as a team. They're really foreigner-dominated, including Sergey Grandkin at the center, a bunch of Americans. You got Ben Patch on the right, uh, Jeff Jendrick in the middle, Nehemiah Moza, the Australian in the middle, uh, Tim Carl, the Frenchman on the left, Santiago Danani, the Argentinian at the libero. Really, their only uh, German guy in the starting lineup is Ruben Schott, the other outside hitter. And they just have a really fun play style. They were able to figure out a matchup against a huge blocking team in Zenit St. Petersburg and withstand some crazy runs and go on some runs of their own. There were some incredible serving performances from Berlin in, in that Zenit St. Petersburg series. And now they have a very interesting and different matchup against this Trentino team that I'm very curious to see how they navigate. So Trentino, if you haven't been following along with them this year, they play a very interesting, unique style as well. They run three outside hitters. So you have Matej Kaziski, the Bulgarian legend, who won three Champions Leagues for Trentino back in uh, from 2009 to 2011. He's back. You have Alessandro Micheletto, one of the great young superstars in the entire game. And then you have Daniele Lavia, who's an out outstanding young Italian outside hitter as well. So they have all three of those guys, all outside hitters, in the starting lineup. They line up Lavia opposite uh, Ricardo Spertoli. So he lines up their, their setter. He kind of lines up in the, op the traditional opposite spot, but all three of those guys kind of shift around and hit in different positions on the court. And it's kind of a flexible free-flowing offense that Trentino runs. And it's really cool. It's really fun to watch. It's really unique. And it's an interesting matchup for other teams to try and learn and scout and understand because you just don't see anything else like this. Uh, it's really fun for me to watch. I love this Trentino team. And really the only team this year that they haven't really been able to beat is Perugia. They've beaten them a couple times, but um, including losing to Perugia in the Cup Finals, the Italian Cup Finals this past weekend. So this Trentino team, you've got the, the three outside hitter system, like I said. you got Res Ricardo Spertoli at the setter. you got two great, great middles, both Serbian and Marko Pedrosian and Stresko Lisinac, both incredible. And then another interesting storyline is Julian Zenger at their libero coming over from Berlin. Zenger, former Berlin player, a German national team member coming to Trentino this year. So that'll certainly be fun to watch. This is a very interesting matchup. Trentino is going to play their game for sure. They're going to touch balls defensively. They're going to try and score on high balls. They've got just great, they're a great blocking team as well. Uh, Daniele Lavia, the second leading blocker in the entire Champions League so far. Uh, and he's not even a middle. Normally, you get that the blocking lead is, is reserved for middle blockers, but uh, Lavia, an outstanding blocker. So that's another advantage for Trentino. But this style battle is going to be really interesting to me, and I don't know how to pick this. I have no idea what to predict with Berlin versus Trentino because they're so different, and 
the only thing that we do know is that now Berlin has proven themselves against elite level European competition elsewhere, and they can do this. This is absolutely anybody's game. Um, this 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 match this week is in Italy. Uh, next week, I believe next Wednesday, maybe Thursday, will be in Germany for the second leg. Uh, also, these two teams played a quarterfinal series last year, which Trentino won both matches on their way to the finals. I don't know about this one, you guys. This has golden set potential as well. Honestly, it, it could very well bounce both ways. I I think for tr t for today, because just of home court advantage rather than anything else, I'm going to pick Trentino. Let's say Trentino in four. I could very well see that. Sometimes they go on these just demoralizing runs. You you get Alessandro Micheletto that lights up the service line for five points in a row, and and sometimes that's just it. And sometimes you just can't get him off the line. That that happens against Trentino a lot. So Berlin's Berlin's side out offense is going to be a lot, under a lot of pressure to hang around, and they'll have to figure out how to manufacture some points on their serve as well. For now, I'm going to go with Trentino in four for this evening as my pick, but totally could go to a golden set depending on what happens in Germany next week. So that is about all the time we have, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is time to flip over and watch this match, Trentino versus Berlin. First serve coming up in just about 15 minutes live here on the YouTube channel. So the link's in the description. Uh, make sure you know where to find the match. Uh, I will be on the call. It'll be a blast. I, I just can't wait to watch it. So uh, enough formalities. Thank you very much for watching the European Volleyball Show, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, enjoy the match tonight. We will see you next week. Thanks for watching.